So no doubt you have seen the news from yesterday as of the making of this video. There was an attempted assassination on a former president and current presidential candidate, Donald Trump. Now, right off the bat, it's important to recognize that an innocent person lost their life. A father was shielding his wife and his daughters and actually was killed by gunfire from the would-be assassin. It's horrendous, it's inexcusable, and my heart breaks for his family. I just this morning preached from the book of Habakkuk where Habakkuk is crying out about the violence and the contention and the strife and the evil in his society. And all I can do is echo Habakkuk's words to God when things like this happen happen. Adana, Adonai, how long, O oh Lord? Now, here at Disciple Dojo, we do not take political stances when it comes to political candidates or parties. Christians come to widely different opinions on how the kingdom of God should work itself out in the world of politics. There are faithful Christians who are supporters of Donald Trump. There are faithful Christians who do not support Donald Trump. And there are faithful Christians who are in the middle and just don't really know what to think about all of this. And that's not what I even want to touch on. This is not a political or a partisan video whatsoever. However, I've seen things on social media that as a Bible teacher, I think are important and very much worth commenting upon in this moment. As soon as the events happened, as soon as I saw it on my social media feed, my mind immediately went to Revelation 13. And I was like, I bet somebody's going to try to tie this in together and talk about predictive prophecy and, and this coming true and all of this stuff. And of course, over the past 24 hours, as I've been checking in, scrolling on social media, I have seen it mentioned. And so what I want to do is look at Revelation chapter 13 in this video and look at what it says, look at what it doesn't say, and look at what it is definitely saying to us right now at this moment in our nation's history. And before we jump in, if this video interests you and you want to go deeper and, and Revelation, let's say it's a book that scares you or it's intimidating or it's a book that you're super fascinated with and you have all the end time charts on your walls and you've done detailed studies on all of the different world empires and beasts and antichrists and all of that, let me invite you to do two things. Number one, check out the playlist here on the channel. We have an Understanding the Book of Revelation playlist, a series of videos. They're not sequential. They just deal with different aspects of Revelation, of eschatology, of end times, interviews with different scholars, my own teaching on the subject. All of that is in our Revelation playlist. The second thing I want to invite you to do, we have a course here called Revelation, a guided tour of the apocalypse. It's entirely free. It comes with a downloadable workbook participant guide. You can watch all the sessions. You can download the workbook right from our website. I'm going to link that in the video description below, but the course is entirely free for any individual, any small group, any church to use, however you see fit. The purpose is to just get people into the book of Revelation, understanding it on its own terms, because it's one of the most profoundly relevant books in the entire Bible. And it's also one of the most misinformed interpreted, unfortunately. And so that's what we're going to touch on here in this video. If you haven't already, we'd appreciate it if you would subscribe. That really helps us continue to offer more free teaching and resources like this. But let's look at Revelation 13 and see what we can make of it. So I put it up here on accordance on screen and we're just going to read through it. And I just want to give some background and comment on what it may or may not be saying right now in light of this weekend's events. And I've just got the NRSV UE pulled up here. It's just a standard scholarly translation, but pretty much all of the translations out there say basically the same thing. It says, and I saw a beast rising out of the sea with 10 horns and seven heads. And on its horns were 10 diadems and on its head were blasphemous names. So John is in this vision. This is a section. This is the center of the book of Revelation, starting in chapter 12. And he's seeing this apocalyptic vision, these cosmic images. It started with a woman in the heavens giving birth and then the dragon trying to destroy the woman, not being able to, then trying to destroy her child, not being able to. And so then going off and making war on the rest of her children, as the text says. And so at the end of chapter 12, the dragon basically takes a stand on the seashore and calls forth this beast 
out of the sea. And this beast, this is apocalyptic imagery. So numbers like seven and 10 uh, have significance in terms of fullness or completion, totality, things like horns, which is symbols of strength or diadems, crowns, which are symbol of authority. And not just those, but also this beast is characterized by blasphemous names. The vision goes on. The beast that I saw was like a leopard. Its feet were like a bear's and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. Now, these are all images that are pulled from the book of Daniel, his visions of these worldly empires that were going to arise. And originally in Daniel's visions, they were images of Babylon, the Medo-Persian empire, the Greek empire under Alexander the Great, particularly the leopard. And then ultimately this fearsome, mighty empire with these huge teeth that just crushed everything, which by the time of the first century, a lot of interpreters were seeing as describing the Roman. Empire. Well, Revelation's vision just kind of amalgamates all of these into this beast figure that John sees rising out of the sea at the behest of the dragon, who is Satan himself. And the dragon gave it his power and his throne and great authority. So the dragon was the one that animates the beast in this vision. Now, here's where all the craziness begins in light of the assassination attempt on President Trump and him actually getting shot in the ear. Verse three, talking about the beast, one of its heads seemed to have received a death blow, but its fatal wound had been healed. In amazement, the whole earth followed the beast. So this is where people are saying, look, in this vision of the beast, uh, he's he's wounded in the head and it looks like a fatal wound. It should have killed him, but it doesn't. He was miraculously healed. And so therefore, oh, Revelation is predicting what happened yesterday. Trump, he was shot in the head. He should have died. If he'd moved his head one centimeter, he would be dead and it would be a whole new thing and blah, blah, blah. But he was miraculously preserved. And so some people, based on their politics, that is the hand of God preserving this righteous anointed leader who's going to take control of the country and make America great again. And they, people are worshiping Trump. I mean, that iconic picture of him with his fist in the air and the flag behind him, like you could not have asked for a better photo op than that. I mean, that is the best campaign material in modern history by far. And that's how some people are seeing this. The other people are looking and going, oh no, look, this is revelation unfolding and Trump is the beast. I mean, right down to receiving a head wound and being miraculously healed. And this is just another sign that we are approaching the end and the tribulation is about to come and the antichrist is about to arise and all of these events are happening. So get ready, keep watching the Middle East, keep looking to Israel, keep seeing what's going on. You know, like people are just, they're reading all kinds of stuff into it. And I wanna suggest something. This image, Revelation 13, is not at all about the events of yesterday literally, but it has everything to do with the events of yesterday at the level of theology. Here's what I mean by that. The people marvel. Verse three, it says, and one, meon, ekton, kephelon, one of the heads, altu, of him, hos esphagmenen, like having been slaughtered. And not just like to, to get the point across, John's like, and it didn't look like it had just been kind of grazed. Like we're not talking about a bloody ear. Like having been slaughtered to death. This is describing a completely slaughtered carcass of a head, what it looks like. If anything, and I don't want to get too graphic, but think about the Zapruder film in a previous assassination in this country. When JFK, we had to watch that in school and, and it just turned my stomach every time I saw it. It still does. Like, see, that is, that is the image of a head looking as if it had been slaughtered unto death. And that's what John sees in his vision regarding this beast, this beast rising out of the ocean that looks so mighty, you know, horns and crowns and features like a leopard and a bear and a lion. I mean, it is the epitome of might, this beastly figure. And it looks as if it's been slaughtered to death. Que e plege tu thanatu atu and the wound of his death. Therapeutic, having been healed. Therapeutic, this is where we get the word therapeutic from, by the way. So this is what John sees in his vision. 
this great beastly figure, this mighty, ferocious, all-powerful figure looked as if it had been slaughtered to death. I mean, it had a fatal head wound, but then the wound was healed. And it doesn't say by who, it doesn't say why, it doesn't give any of that. It just says the wound was healed. And as a result, look what the people do. Continuing in verse 3, and they marveled. They were filled with wonder. All the earth after the beast, seeing this beast that looked invulnerable and then looked like it had been killed, but then it was miraculously healed. It makes everyone just be like, I'm with that guy. Like they fought, they marvel. They cannot believe what are the odds? This has to be divine. This guy is worth following. That's what gets people to worship the beast. The beast looks invulnerable. The beast looks unconquerable. People are impressed by power and they think, we got to follow this. Look what they're going to say, verse 4. Que prosecunesan to draconti. And they worshipped and they bowed down to the dragon. They worshipped the dragon, the one who had called forth the beast. Hati edoken, because he gave tain exousion, the authority, the power, totherio to the beast. The beast was the one who had been given the power, but the power was not given by God. The power, the authority, the seemingly indestructibility in Revelation, that's given by the dragon. It's miraculous, all right, but it's not miraculous from above. It's miraculous from below. And that's what makes everybody worship the dragon and worship K. Praskunesan Totheriu, the beast, Legonte, saying, and this is what they say about after seeing this miraculous death wound to the head being healed, who is like the beast? And who is able or has the ability, polemese, to wage war, to fight against? him. This is where we get the word polemic from, this verb polemesi. So they see the beast. They see this miraculous bringing back from the brink of death. It looks like he's finished, but he's saved. And, and, and it just causes them to wonder and to marvel and to worship the beast and the dragon who empowered him. Now, in the rest of the chapter, then the beast goes on, he's given power, he starts uh, doing all these things, getting the world to follow after him. Then there's another beast that comes up, not from the sea, but from the land. In, in our course here on Revelation, we talk all about what this meant at the time. And basically, in Revelation 13, the beast is an image collectively of Rome. And if you want to know why we say that, check out some of the other videos in the playlist, check out the course here on the channel. But the beast symbolizes collectively the Roman Empire. And interestingly, it's picking up on what's called the Nero Ridivivus myth. If you watch our superhero seminary video where Professor Beastman over my shoulder here talks about what 666 actually means and why it's the number of this beast. Well, when Nero died, and, and Nero died by stabbing himself in the throat, by the way, uh, talk about a head wound unto death. When Nero died, it looked like the empire was going to collapse. There was uproar, there was turmoil, there was a succession of emperors that were vying for power right after him. And then finally, another one arose on the scene and sort of saved the empire in the eyes of its subjects. So Rome looked as if it had been fatally wounded in the head, like Caesar kills himself, but is preserved and is healed and then goes on to continue oppressing God's people ultimately, which is what Revelation is written to help them endure. So what does this have to do with Trump being shot in the head by a would-be assassin and yet surviving? Um, nothing. On the literal level, this is not a prediction of any of the events of this weekend. This is no more prediction of that than this was a prediction of JFK being shot in the head, or Ronald Reagan and his would-be assassin, or Archduke Franz Ferdinand being shot and that leading to World War I. This is not, Revelation 13 is not predictive of a world event that was going to happen far in the future from the time of the audience of Revelation. If Revelation 13 was about Donald Trump, what means? meaning would it have had to the churches at Smyrna, Ephesus, Laodicea, Sardis, Philadelphia, Thyatira, Pergamum? What would they have gotten from that message? Hey, churches, I know you're going to be persecuted, and I know you're going to be tempted to give in to the might of the Roman Empire and to lose faith and to stop walking after Jesus, but let me show you a vision of 2,000 years in the future in another continent that you guys don't even know about yet, about some guy who's going to be shot in the head but miraculously survived. 
What are we even talking about? What would that have said to the first hearers of Revelation? Zero. Nothing. So, is Revelation 13 about Donald Trump? No. But, Revelation 13 is about American empire. Because it's about any empire. And the tendency that we have, and I say we collectively meaning humans, to look towards people who seem invincible. To clamor for a strong man. Someone who's going to make the country great again. Bring us back. Pull us from the brink of oblivion. Turn the country around. I mean, all of this over-the-top rhetoric that we constantly apply to crooked and corrupt and earthly human leaders. It's not unique to America. It's not unique to modern history. They've been doing it since the ancient empires of Sumeria, Babylon, Egypt. It's nothing new. What should be troubling is how quickly people are willing to ascribe worship to these world figures, these world empires, these ideologies, these concepts. People are always looking for the great leader. And that's one of the things that Revelation keys in on. And, you know, this amazement, this marveling that the whole earth experiences, and then they follow the beast. They worship the dragon. They worship the beast because this power. Look at what they say. Who is like the beast? Who can fight against it? I mean, as soon as the stuff with Trump happened, you saw that picture of him raising the fist and the flag in the background, and it was plastered on some people's social media feeds with captions and wording to go with it that is nothing short of worship. There were already memes of how tough Trump is and how determined and gritty and you can't kill him. He can't be stopped. This guy is just, he is who we need. You know, people, they were marveling in amazement. They were saying, who is who can fight against this? See, this is why I say Revelation 13 has everything to do with our current cultural setting here in this country and around the world. Not because it predicted any of the events of this weekend. I don't think it did. Many politicians have been shot at. Many have been hit, even in the head. Many have survived. This is not anything new. Rather, the importance and what I would suggest, the significance of Revelation 13 is in our attitude as we look at these events. Whether it's a would-be assassination of a president or whether it's a world empire that looks like it's on its last leg, but then rises up with might, whether it's shock and awe of a mighty military around the world and patriotic anthems saying, who can fight against it? This is the temptation that all empires face and America is not excluded. So Revelation has a message to Christians. Are we gonna marvel after the beast because of his might? Whether that beast is a Republican, whether that beast is a Democrat, spoiler alert, it's both. Or are we going to worship the Lamb? See, the counterpoint in Revelation to the beast, to this figure in chapter 13, is the Lamb who was introduced in chapter 5. You see, all the way back up in Revelation 5, when the whole vision was introduced and John was getting this vision of God's throne room, basically. And there was a scroll that he saw in the right hand of God. And and this was an edict, an imperial edict in the vision, you know, the plan that's going to be set in motion. And all of a sudden, nobody can open the scroll and break its seals. Nobody can put the plan into effect. Nobody in heaven, on earth, under the earth. And so in verse 4, John begins to weep bitterly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or look into it. John knows that in order for history to move forward, one who is worthy has to come and put God's plan into effect. And he weeps because no one on earth, living or dead, that's what it means by no one on the earth or under the earth, no one in human history is able or worthy to put God's plan into effect. So John weeps, and then one of the elders, he says, don't weep, look, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And check this out, John hears, hey, lion of Judah, root of David, has conquered, and then he turns and looks, and we have a video on this by Professor Lion-O here over my shoulder in our Superhero Seminary playlist that talks all about this Lion of Judah in Revelation, who is the Lamb. When John turns and looks, what he actually sees, then I saw between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, a Lamb, our neon, 
This is the word for lamb standing. And look at this, not just any lamb. Os esphagmenon. Does this look familiar? Having been slaughtered. Not seeming to have been slaughtered, having been slaughtered. Not being healed, having been slaughtered. And yet, paradoxically, ekon kerata hepta, having seven horns. Remember, horns are a symbol of strength. Keoptomas hepta, and seven eyes. U esin ta hepta pnumata tutheu, which they are, these seven eyes, the seven spirits of God. Apestamenoi. Is pasan te gain, having been sent into all the earth. See, the beast of chapter 13 in Revelation is nothing but a parody of the lamb in chapter 5 of Revelation. And it's the lamb, the one, Esphagmenon, having been slaughtered. That's what makes him worthy. See, in the eyes of the people of Revelation 13, it was a fact that the beast looked as if he was esphagmenon, same word, that he having been slaughtered, but the wound of his death was healed. And it's the healing, the saving from death, not letting the beast experience death, but the seeming indestructibility of the beast. That's what makes Hoi Ege, all the people of the earth, follow after him in wonder and amazement. Because people of the earth worship power, they worship invincibility, they worship might, but the people of God, they worship a slaughtered lamb. And that's the difference between the beast of Revelation 13, and the lamb of Revelation 5, and that's what Revelation has to say to us today. Do we marvel after the indestructibility, the unbeatability of our favorite political leader on either side, in any party, for any country for that matter. Is that what we clamor after? Is that what we're impressed by? Is that what we look at and go, oh, that must mean that this guy, God's on his side. Is that really what we're about? Or do we heed the message of Revelation? And do we follow the one who was the slaughtered lamb and because of, not in spite of, but through his being slaughtered, he is the only one who is worthy of all power, all authority, all might, all honor, and all worship. That's actually, if you've been looking at my shirt, I wear this in a lot of videos. This is our Disciple Dojo design, worthy is the lamb. This is the text, worthy is the lamb having been slain. He's the only one who is worthy to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. That's seven things, by the way. This is who we worship. This is who followers of Jesus bow to and no one else. So the events of this weekend, does Revelation 13 speak to them? No. Does it speak to the attitude and does it, does it cut to the quick of how we as citizens on this earth, look at earthly powers, look at worldly leaders, look at events of political or societal significance, absolutely it does. And Revelation, just like the rest of scripture, it challenges us. So again, this video is in no way a political statement about anything involving this election. I think as followers of Jesus, we can thank God that Trump's life was spared while also crying out and mourning that someone else's life wasn't. And I think that that has no reflection whatsoever on our larger political views. I think good, faithful Christians can still not be in favor of Trump as the next president. And I think good, faithful Christians can be in favor of Trump as the next president. And I think that there can be good, faithful reasons for both of those positions. It'll depend on how you weigh a whole number of factors. We've got to resist this false binary thinking of either or. If you like this, then that means you believe this. If you support this guy, that means that this is what you're all about. Please, Disciple Dojo viewers, Please resist the urge to, to embrace that either or culture war clickbaity thinking. It doesn't reflect well on the kingdom of God. It's not a fruit of the spirit and it prevents the unity among God's people that is desperately needed in the midst of tumultuous times. And I say unity, not uniformity, because we will not always agree. And that is perfectly okay. So while Revelation 13 doesn't 
pinpoint specific prophetic events that we're still waiting to happen on this earthly geopolitical stage. What it does do is pinpoint the condition of our heart and challenge us. Are you like those in all the earth who wonder after power and authority? And do you say, yeah, who can wage war against the beast? Or are you someone who looks at the beasts of this earth, the would-be rulers, the mighty powers and the authorities, the governments and the flags that they wave and say, I'm going to follow the lamb, not any of the imitators. That's the message with which Revelation has challenged God's people for 2,000 years now. And so I hope it continues to do just that. That's all for now. Thanks for watching. Again, if you're interested in doing a deeper dive on Revelation, see our Revelation, a guided tour of the apocalypse course. It's been available on the website for over a decade now. Many churches and small groups and individuals have done it. It's entirely free. All of our Disciple Dojo resources, teaching materials that we put out, video, audio, they're all entirely free. And that's only because people believe in and support this ministry. If you're interested in picking up your own Worthy is the Lamb shirt, these are customizable, by the way. You can get this in any color. You can change the color of the wording. You can even add your own wording on there. Just use the link in the description below to our Zazzle store. We don't really make a lot of money off these things. They're not done to fund the ministry, although, you know, every little dollar helps. But it's more to just give people a tangible reminder that there's only one who is worthy to receive our honor and our praise and our adulation. So may we always follow the Lamb. That's all for now. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time back here at Disciple Dojo. As always, keep training.